Last time we uh, really jumped in feet first. It's one of those evenings we took, I think, five verses and really spent the whole period of time on that. And uh, I'm hoping, from all the reactions I've had, I hope it wasn't too scary. I hope on the one hand it seemed real, and on the other hand you didn't leave here terrified. You know, it reminds me in a sense of the guy that was a ventriloquist, had excellent skills as a ventriloquist, but he's going broke. His dummy was all tattered and beat up and useless, and it just there was just no market for ventriloquists. His buddy said, hey, that's no problem. Why don't you go into, into seances and be a medium? He said, hey, that's a great idea. So he uh, put out a sign and so forth. First guy comes in. He says, well, what do you charge? He says, well, if you want to talk to a departed loved one, it's 50 bucks. If you want to do it while I'm drinking a glass of water, it's $75. I think my wife is right. I have a perverse sense of humor. <laughs> you pray for right. But speaking of not getting the point, I hope that uh, Isaiah 14 wasn't too rough last time. What Isaiah is doing is sweeping right around the Gentile nations around Israel. And uh, we, of course, are right in the middle of his um, uh, discussion of Babylon. Right in the middle of that discussion, of course, we have this excerpt that we spent time on last time, uh, the origin and uh, career, if you will, of Lucifer. But that brought us down to verse 18. We'll continue from there tonight. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one of them in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy sepulcher like an abominable branch. That's an interesting phrase, the abominable branch. That's in contrast to the branch of Isaiah 11, if you recall. The Tzemek, the, uh, the Netzer, the, the uh, title of none other than Jesus Christ. But this is obviously in contrast to him. Who cast out like an abominable branch. And like a raiment of those that are slain thrust through the sword that go down the stones of the pit, like a carcass trampled under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned, or more properly, never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name the remnant, the son, the nephew, saith the Lord. And I will make it a possession for the porcupine, or properly a bittern, which is actually a water bird. Uh, but in any case, uh, make a possession for whatever that animal is, and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. A broad castigation and judgment on Babylon. You can uh, torture the text either way. You can point to local applications, but on the other hand, we're also in a sweep that speaks of the day of the Lord, and that'll become very clear as we go a little further here. Anyways, that wraps up Babylon. Now he takes uh, the next th uh, four verses. Uh, Isaiah focuses again on Assyria. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, verse 24, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so it shall stand. That's quite a verse. That really applies to everything the Lord says. Amos tells us that he does nothing but that which he reveals to his servants, the prophets. What God says, he does. And every time I have made a mistake, and there were lots of them in the Bible, it's because I didn't take it literally enough. So when you get those verses 24, I really like that. You see, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. As I have purposed, so shall it stand. And we should keep that in mind as we go through the Scripture, Old and New Testament, as God describes what he's going to do that there is going to be a reckoning, there is going to be a judgment, there is going to be a conclusion. It will not be business as usual. We need to realize God means what he says and says what he means. But now verse 25, he continues, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains, tread them underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the Assyrian empire. No, no. So what it says upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations, which gives you a clear indication that this does not just refer to Assyria itself. The title, the Assyrian, is one of the titles that the Old Testament uses of the coming world leader. Does that mean he's of an Assyrian background? Not necessarily. What it means is the word the Assyrian has become a title a global leader. And uh, so be alert to that. You'll find that show up all through the Old Testament, the Assyrian. Isaiah will have more to say about him later. 
So I point that out to you. You can check Isaiah 10, uh, 25 through 27, where that came up, but also Micah 5 and uh, Zephaniah 2. You'll find that phrase popping up again and again. And where he talks here in verse 26 about the whole earth, that's the tip-off. We're talking about the day of the Lord. We're talking about the day of the Lord. Daniel 11, Isaiah 30, we'll deal with a lot with it there. Micah 5, Daniel 8, and so on. Verse 27, For the Lord of hosts hath purposed it, and who shall annul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Okay, now the chapter will conclude with five verses about Philistia. And uh, while Philistia is, of course, the Philistines, they're of Egyptian origin right on the edge, on the eastern edge of uh, Egypt, on the west coast there, if you will. Philistia in the Greek was Palestina, from which the Latin is Palestine. It's from that group that the name Palestine for the whole area of the land comes from. But again, don't confuse that. This really refers to specifically the Philistines. Verse 28, the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Rejoice not, thou, O Palestine, or O Philistia, because the rod of him who smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth an adder, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, Cry, O city, thou, O Philistia, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer, the messengers of the nations, that the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it? Okay, a sweep against uh, Philistia does have an uh, interesting phrase there, for out of the serpent's root. Remember we talked about the root of David. And we also speak of the title of Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. And last time we talked about the seed of the serpent. And here we have not only the seed of the serpent, we have the root of the serpent. So we have this sinister backdrop on these nations. Continuing. Some of this could be very locally applied. Tilgath Pileser had died, and Shalmaneser, and then Sargon had risen, and, and much of this can be viewed as having been fulfilled historically. At the same time, there also may be an end time coloration to it. All of this will come up again later in Isaiah. Chapter 15 and 16, now he turns his attention to Moab. Now, Moab and Ammon and Edom are three ancient names that you and I know today as Jordan. We know it as Jordan. When the British established the Israel uh, partition, they created two countries of roughly very large equal size. Israel and Transjordan. What most people don't know is in 1922, Israel negotiated away a major portion of their land in exchange for peace. So this land for peace idea was tried back in the 20s, and obviously has had not much of an impact. Uh, Israel's attitude today is, if you want land for peace, you've got the land, we've got the peace, we'll trade. But uh, that's, a, that's not what uh, Baker and those guys seem to have in mind. Any case, we're now going to talk about Moab. It's interesting how, uh, you know, we reach in our history and try to take pride in our origins. Well, if you're from Moab, you've got a problem, because Moab descended from the eldest son of Lot, which resulted from incest with Lot's daughter. That's not a very proud heritage, I guess. If you recall in, uh, in Genesis 19, the two daughters of Lot got him drunk, and they each slept with him, getting pregnant. The oldest had uh, Moab as a son, and the younger one had Ammon. So Moabites and Ammonites came from that ancestral relationship, which is uh, pretty grim. Now, Moab, historically, pretended to be a friend of, of Israel, but then um, uh, really ended up turning on them. And symbolically, if you're into typology or, or spiritual perspective, that whole issue seems to suggest uh, having a profession without legitimate claim. And uh, if you study that, the history of uh, the Moabites. Moab uh, also emerges in numbers, if you recall, when um, the king of Moab was a guy by the name of Balak. And in numbers, we have this fascinating character surfaced by the name of Balaam. And he was a Gentile prophet. And he's an enigma because he does prophesy, and yet he's a, a strange character. And uh, Balak, the king of Moab, hires Balaam to curse Israel. And uh, this is Numbers uh, oh, 22, 23, and 31, for those of you who really want to dig into it. Balaam is rebuked by his own donkey, as you know, and uh, 
Every time I read that story, it reminds me of some of my staff meetings in the past. In any case, Balaam uh, is hired to curse Israel, and he refuses to do that because God uh, tells him not to. So he doesn't curse Israel, he keeps blessing him. That frustrates his employer, Balak. But what he finally does do is he counsels Balak on how to defeat Israel. He says, all you have to do to defeat Israel is get their God to turn on them, and the way you do that is to have their men mix with your pretty girls. So what you do is get all your most attractive young ladies on the border, have them mix with the Israelis, and when they, um, uh, when they do that, God will turn on them. And of course, the girls do just that. The men mix with them and uh, get enticed by them. And uh, what uh, Balaam did not count on was God's grace. He, he assumed that God didn't have the ability to show his grace. But in any case, uh, that's a, an important event, not so much just for the Old Testament, but you won't understand the letter that Jesus Christ dictates or writes to Pergamos in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, which is marriage to the world. And in that letter, Jesus makes reference to this whole story of Balaam and Balak and the Moabites, and you won't understand the tone of the letter unless you do your little homework in Numbers uh, 22, 23, 31, that whole story of Balaam and Balak. So um, we, we won't take the time tonight to get into it, but that's enough. If you're interested, you can track that down. The other place Moab shows up is there's a gal by the name of Naomi. She and her husband and their two sons are, are they're suffering from famine in Bethlehem, so she moves to Moab. Her husband dies. The two sons have taken uh, Moabite as uh, girls for wives, and um, the sons also die. So here is Naomi with two daughters-in-law, but also about this time she's destitute. She, things are better in Bethlehem, so she's going to go home. And you all know the story. Neither of the daughters want to leave her. She finally insists they do, one does, but Ruth refuses to leave, clings to Naomi, and they have the incredible love story in the book of Ruth, a four-chapter book that is an incredible love story, even by secular literature standards, but also the key to understanding Revelation 5. So the whole uh, background and study of Ruth I commend to you. But that's, again, remember she was a Moabitess. She's a Gentile bride that shows up in the family tree of Jesus Christ, being the grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, of David. And uh, when we celebrate the shepherd's fields at Christmas time, those fields were probably the fields of Ruth and Boaz, as portrayed in Ruth uh, chapter 4. So it's a worthwhile study of Ruth and Naomi and all of that. It's interesting that when David was fleeing Saul, that he took his parents and sent them to Moab for their safety. Saul was after David. You all know the story. It never occurred to you that his parents would be in trouble, right? With the king being after David. Why would David feel that his parents would be secure in Moab? Because he was a descendant of the Moabites in the sense of Ruth. See? Interesting. So anyway, that's a little background on Moab. But Moab uh, pretends to be a friend of Israel, but really isn't, and turns on them, becomes Israel's enemy at several, several occasions in the 11th hour. And so we have the judgment of Moab in uh, Isaiah 15 and 16. We'll whip through it. You might also make a note, for those of you who want to do some extra study, this same judgment is a major subject of Jeremiah chapter 48. So Isaiah deals with it here in chapter 15 and 16. Jeremiah deals with it 100 years later in uh, Jeremiah chapter 48. But jumping into Isaiah 15, verse 1, the burden of Moab, the masa, the heavy uh, judgment of uh, Moab. Because in the night of our, of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. Because in the night here of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. He has gone up to Baath and to Dibbon. Baath, by the way, was a temple of Baal, by the way, and uh, Dibbon is interesting, just to put a footnote there. It was at Dibbon they discovered the so-called Moabite stone, a very famous find in archaeology. It's famous for two reasons. It was the first recorded alphabet, an alphabet in contrast to a pictograph, the Moabite stone. It's also famous because the records of the Moabite stone are uh, supportive or consistent with the biblical record. So the Moabite stone is something in your archaeology books you, you can make a note of. It was found at Dibbon. In any case, moving on. He's gone to Baath and to Dibbon, the high places, to weep. Moab shall wail over Nebo. Remember, Nebo was where Moses was buried. And uh, over Mediba. Uh, Nebo is mentioned in Numbers 32 and 33, First Chronicles 5, Jeremiah 48, of course, and so on. Mediba is mentioned in Numbers 21 and... Um, uh, Joshua 13, 1 Chronicles 19, uh, you can dig those out either through a Bible atlas and or a uh, concordance if you're 
interested in digging into those places. But there are obviously places in the area of called Moab, east of the Dead Sea. On all their heads shall be baldness, every beard cut off. What that refers to is mourning. Shaving was a sign of mourning in that culture. In their streets they shall gird themselves with sackcloth on the tops of the houses, and in their streets everyone shall wail, weeping abundantly, and Heshbon shall cry out. Heshbon is about 20 miles east of the Jordan, just to give you a rough feeling for the geography here. Heshbon shall cry out, and Eli, and their voice shall be heard even to Jehaz. Therefore the armed soldiers of Moab shall cry out, his life shall be grievous unto him. My heart shall cry out for Moab, his fugitives shall flee unto Zor, to Eglath Shalashia. Zor, you recall, was one of the cities that was spared at the pleading of uh, Lot. Remember when the angels were going to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, the five cities? Uh, Lot, get out of there. Well, Lot talked them into sparing the one little city, Zor. And that's why it may sound familiar to you from Genesis uh, 19. And for by the ascent of Luhith with weeping shall they go up, for in the way of another place I'm probably mispronouncing, uh, Horonaim, uh, they shall raise up a cry of destruction, for the waters of Nimrim shall be desolate, for the hay is withered away, the grass faileth, there is no green thing. Therefore, the abundance they have gotten, and that which they have laid up, shall they carry away to the brook of the willows. For cry is gone round about the borders of Moab, the wailing of it into Eglaim, and its howling unto Beer Elim. The waters of Dimon shall be full of blood, and I will bring more upon Dimon, lions upon him that escapeth of Moab, and upon the remnant of the land. And he's going to continue some more here, but uh, obviously um, Moab's uh, primacy of those days has been long eclipsed, is now vast waste. In fact, one of the most interesting things, if you take a flight at a fairly good altitude over Israel, it's really provocative to see the Jordan River. You see up north the Sea of Galilee, you see the Jordan River go all the way down to the Dead Sea. West of the Jordan River is fertile farmland. It's green, it's cultivated, it's rich. And east of that river is desolation, just raw desert. And it's a shock to actually visually see what some effort and uh, commitment has done to the difference in the land. Because prior to 48, you could look at that and see it was just a mix of unreclaimed swamp and desert, two extremes. And now when you fly over that, uh, even in a casual flight, you, you just can't uh, believe the contrast. So Moab is desolate. However, let me not finish with Moab. Moab is obviously under judgment, and yet Moab and Ammon and Edom, these three places, are going to escape the dominion of the Antichrist, the coming world leader. And that's in Daniel 8. It's very strange. They somehow, of all the whole world that's under his dominion, they escape. And the reason they escape is they provide a refuge for the remnant. And we'll see some hits of that as we go on here. Chapter 16, verse 1. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. Don't confuse that. Sending the lamb makes it sound, Jesus, the lamb of God. Not exactly. What the deal is, is under David and Solomon, Moab was put under tribute. They uh, had to uh, supply 100,000 lambs and the, the, the wool of 100,000 rams as tribute to Israel. So it was like a tax. And uh, it's about the time that Isaiah is writing that Moab is rebelling against that and refusing to do that. Then you can find this in first, Second Kings 3 and Second Chronicles uh, 20, because they are revolting during Isaiah's day, and they are joining with the Ammonites in this rebellion. And Isaiah is telling them, don't do that. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah. Now, Selah is a synonym for Petra, also called Basra. And we're going to talk a lot about that later in Isaiah, because that's the place that Jesus Christ is seen coming in the second coming, stained with blood. Isaiah 63, for those of you that want to peek ahead, but we'll deal with that when we get there. The land of Selah to the wilderness, unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that like a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so shall the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of noonday. Hide the outcast, betray not him that wandereth. There's going to be a refuge there, obviously, of the remnant, and we'll talk about that as that develops. Verse 4, Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert that is covering to them from the face of the spoiler. 
spoiler here isn't like him that taketh spoil. It's the old English use. For the extortioner is at an end, the spoiler ceaseth, and the oppressors are consumed out of the land. Interesting situation. We'll get into this uh, later in Isaiah, but it's the, basically the scenario that uh, the possibility that uh, Hosea chapter 5 refers to, where Hosea 6 is the prayer, where Israel, the remnant, will flee uh, to this area, and when the Antichrist has his forces arrayed against Jerusalem, the, uh, why would he shift his forces against Edom and Moab? Because that's where the remnant have flown in accordance with Christ's instructions in Matthew 24, and uh, they uh, petition. I guess I've gotten into it. Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5, last verse, God is speaking through Hosea. He says, I will go and return. It's verse 15, Hosea 5, 15. I will go and return to my place. What does that mean? How can God return to his place? He must have left it. Huh? I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. In a number of places in the Old Testament, the Torah and here, the word offense is singular, specific. What offense is that? The rejection of him as the Messiah. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me early. And this is the prayer they're going to pray. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten us up, he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Jesus Christ was rejected in Matthew 12, when the Pharisees attributed his powers to Satan. That's what gives rise to the unpardonable sin. And that's when he says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There will be no sign given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that obviously is a, a fulfilled in his resurrection. As Jonah spent three days and three nights in the fish, son of man three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Obviously a prophecy of his resurrection, but there are some scholars that believe it has a double reference. That it also refers to the prerequisite condition of the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the rapture. He comes back twice, once for the church, once for Israel. When he comes back for Israel, it'll be in response to their petition to ask him. And when they do, three days, and he interrupts the attack at Edom and Petra. And Isaiah 63 describes his physical appearance where he's bloodstained, having fought on behalf of his own. And this is what is the reference here in Isaiah 16. We'll deal with it in more detail as we get into more detail in later in Isaiah. Petra or Selah meet refers to the rocky parts of Moab, and it's both a specific place, but it's also a region. Yeah, verse 4, you see, it's a petition to take care of his outcasts, the remnant. Betray not him that wandereth, verse 3. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. For the extortioners at an end, and the spoiler ceases, and the oppressors are consumed out of the land. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and, it shall, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and swiftly executing righteousness. Here's a reference to the tabernacle of David. Pause here and turn to Acts 15. We're all familiar with Acts 15, where Paul and Barnabas are raising the issue, does a Gentile have to be a Jew to become saved? The Jewish leadership, the uh, apostles that were Jewish, that were Christian, took for granted that they were still under the old pattern. If a Gentile wanted to be saved, he should become a Jew and then accept Christ. Paul says, no way, a Gentile can be saved. And there's a big brouhaha. It goes on for 13 years until finally they have this uh, brouhaha uh, come to Jerusalem, the, the, the so-called uh, you know, the council there. It's always presented as if they're, make, they're going to make the final adjudication. I don't think that's really what's going on. If you know Paul at all, had they not agreed with him, he would have gone on and done what he was going to do anyway. But uh, they fortunately agree with him, so that issue goes away. But the point is, their issue here is not just, does a Gentile have to become a Jew? That is the issue here. And of course, after Peter does his uh, thing and Paul does his, then James responds on behalf of the council. James, the Lord's brother, is the leader here. Verse 13, after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God first did visit the nations to take out of them a people for his name. What's he referring to? Right now, the church. See, God first will visit the nations, that is Gentiles, and take a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, after what? 
after he calls out a people out of the Gentiles, out of the nations. After this, I will return, Jesus says, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again its ruins, and I will set it up, and so on. He goes on. The point is, Acts 15 deals with two issues. Gee, does a Gentile have to be a Jew to be saved? Of course not. And that's what they conclude. That's what the chapter's all about. We're generally familiar with that. What we also miss, though, there was a second issue that was bothering them. Because if a Gentile does not have to become a Jew, what's to become of Israel? That's the implied concern that's dealt with here. God did first visit the nations, take out of them a people for his name, after this, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David. God is not through with Israel yet. Israel is a, the major element of his final dealing on the planet Earth. He will deal through Israel. And boy, is the, the, it's, it's tragic to see the doctrinal errors that are heaping up once again. You think after 19 centuries of church confusion, which has caused nothing but tragedy on the planet Earth, that we'd finally learn. And from the 70s and 80s, you saw the church get back to the Bible collectively and get their act together. No, uh-uh. It's happening again. You're finding characters running around the country selling the Dominion theology, the Reconstructionists, the replacement theologians, and they're setting the stage for the next Holocaust, the anti-Semitism that, that Jesus predicts in Matthew 24, quoting from Daniel 12. Tragic, tragic, tragic. In any case, back to Isaiah 16, verse 5. See, uh, he will sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. There's that phrase again. Judging and seeking justice and swiftly executing righteousness. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah sitting where? In the tabernacle of David. He's going to rule the world for a thousand years from the throne of David. Verse 6, we have heard the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Therefore shall Moab wail for Moab, and every one shall wail for the foundations of Kirharish. Shall ye mourn, surely they are stricken, and for the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sip, but the, the lords of the nation have broken down the principal plants of it. They are come even to Jazer, they wandered through the wilderness, her branches are stretched out, they are gone over the sea. These are obviously all place names in Moab, but he's making it in, in Isaiah's classical style. He's being very, very uh, articulate describing this. Uh, verse 9, Therefore I will bewail with the weeping of Jesus the, the vine of Sibma. Uh, I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Elie, for the uh, shouting of thy summer fruits, and for, for thy harvest is fallen. For, and gladness is taken away, and the joy out of the plainful field. And the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be any shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine, in their presses I have made their vintage shouting to cease." Wherefore, my heart shall sound like a harp for Moab, and mine inward parts for Keheres. And it shall come to pass, when it is seen, that Moab is weary on the high place, and he shall come to his sanctuary pray, but he shall not prevail. This is the word of the Lord, uh, that the word of the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now the Lord hath spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of a hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be despised with a great multitude, and the remnant shall be very small and feeble." And this, this here refers to the attack by Sennacherib on Moab. The within three years is the years of a hireling. It sounds like a strange phrase, but he's saying it's like a contract, not a day more nor a day less. See, it was like the years of a hireling. You're required to work whatever it requires, but you wouldn't work a day more. But you'll be held to the three years. See, it's an expression. In other words, it's like a contract. So it's going to be three, within three years like a contract, in effect, that Moab shall be uh, uh, nailed, in the, and it was by Sennacherib that was fulfilled. That's chapter uh, 15 and 16 on Moab. Now Isaiah shifts gears. He's going right around the country, speaking of their uh, non-Israel countries here. And now we're going to deal with Syria. In, the idiom is Damascus. That's the capital of Syria. Remember now, Syria was an ally of the northern kingdom that went into slavery. So uh, uh, Syria is an ally of the enemy of Judah. So we have 17, the burden, that is the Masa, the heavy uh, burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Bear in mind, see, it was an empire at the time, and he's describing its destruction. The cities of Arar are forsaken, they shall be for flocks, and shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be like the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall become lean. 
And it shall be as when the reaper gathereth the grain, and the reaper uh, reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as when he gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Yet the gleaning grape shall be left in it, and the shaking of the olive tree, two or three berries, uh, in the top of the uttermost bough, four or five of mo- the out- outmost fruitful branches, saith the Lord God of Israel. At that day shall a man look to his Maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall he respect that which his fingers have made, either the idols or the images. Interesting. Obviously, he's referring to the idol worship of Syria. But notice the uh, parallelism here. At that day shall a man look to his Maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. Boy, could that be aimed at our culture today. Because culturally, we totally ignore our Maker. We do not have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Years ago, even in this country, uh, it was at least fashionable to be Christian. We're in the post-Christian era. Increasingly, it's going to be an embarrassment and awkward. You're going to look upon, if you, you believe the Bible, you take it seriously, you will worship Jesus Christ, you'll look as quaint and weird, and it's going to be tougher. It's not the way it was a, some decades ago. But notice here, it's verse 8, it says, He shall not look to the altars. Okay, we understand that. That's idol worshiping. The work of his hands, neither shall he respect that which his fingers have made. We don't really think of the achievements of man as being an idol, but it is. You know, the space program, you name it. You can just look around the landscape and find things that we extol to take pride in. Now, after Isaiah 14, we've got no perspective on pride. But it's interesting here. Neither shall he respect that which his fingers have made, either the idols or the images. Don't ascribe quaint idols as the only thing that gets between you and God. Anything that gets between you and God is, in effect, an idol. And our own workmanship, our own pride, and our own achievements, uh, the deification of man is our enemy. Perhaps the most insidious false cult of all are not the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Satanists, all these strange groups. The, probably the most insidious cult of all is secular humanism, the official religion of this country. But moving on, verse 9, And that day shall his strong cities be like a forsaken bough in an uttermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and, they, and there shall be desolation, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shalt set it with strange slips. In the day that thou shalt make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make the seed to flourish. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. Strange language to us, but articulate to them in terms of predicting the frustrations they're in for. Verse 12, Woe to the multitude of many people who shall make a noise like the noise of seas and the rushing of nations that make rushing like the rushing of mighty mighty waters. It's interesting how often biblically, not just by Isaiah but elsewhere, the wicked, the nations, the Gentiles are described as rushing waters, the turbulent sea. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Very descriptive, and uh, a frequently used idiom throughout the Bible. Verse 13, The nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and they shall be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at evening at trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of those who spoil us and the lot of those who rob us. Okay, I'm just sweeping through Isaiah 17, the judgment against Syria. Pretty straightforward stuff, articulate and yet pretty directed. Now, we can't spend a lot of time on each passage. We never get through the 66 books, but we'll sweep through what I'll call the easy ones to take on things like chapter 18, little seven-verse chapter that's been the subject of a lot of discussion. Most of your study Bibles will attribute chapter 18 as a judgment against Ethiopia. It may be, and it might not be. Let's take a look at it and judge for ourselves. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention. Back here in uh, chapter 17, as I was sweeping through, it it speaks of these trees and so forth being gone, verses 9 through 11. It's interesting that under the Turkish rule, that they denuded the land of all its trees. Under the Ottoman Empire, they even had a tax that that you had to pay if you had trees. So to avoid the tax, you cut down what trees were left. Josephus talks about when Titus, during his siege in 70 AD, 
totally denuded the Mount of Olives and all around Jerusalem, uh, both Mount of Olives and Mount Scopus of all the trees. They used it, to, in effect, to set the seed, seed drop. And, of course, the reforestation. It started under the British, actually, and, of course, has been intensified under the, in more recent years, has reforested the nation uh, amazingly. So you can get into all of that. But uh, anyway, we'll move on. Isaiah 18 says, Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And, and that's why most commentators view this as being Ethiopia. Except that's not what it says. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, or fluttering with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So now, as we go forward here, we're going to notice a number of things that um, cause some commentators to go way out in the left field, and I'll share with you what some of their views are, but I'm going to, I want to right up front caution you to be very careful because a lot of people really <laughs> move out in left field on this thing. So is this Ethiopia or not? Not clear yet. Many competent commentators really attribute this chapter to Ethiopia. But I'll give you some of the reasons that it might not be as we go. The land the fluttering with wings. Now, incidentally, Ethiopia has a lot of insects, and Ethiopia also has a lot of birds. So some commentators feel that the fluttering with wings points to Ethiopia. I would say it's probably a little inconclusive. But it's a land that is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, verse 2, that's, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and stripped. We'll come back to that and a people terrible from their beginning to this time, a nation measured out and trampled down, whose land the rivers have traversed or spoiled. Okay, first point is, how does Ethiopia send their ambassadors to Israel? That's a test question. There will be a quiz. Acts chapter 8, do you remember? They had this great revival, and then uh, Phillips comes down to meet an Ethiopian treasurer, right? In his ship, right? No, in his chariot. Remember all that? The famous Ethiopian uh, treasure. And he probably, he probably we always visualize him alone. You always see him. He's probably with a caravan. He was a, high, he was a high official. But he was traveling by land. Why? Because Ethiopia was land connected. Could he have traveled by sea? Sure, but he didn't need to. And it's provocative to me that the Holy Spirit makes the point that an Ethiopian traveled by land. This outfit, whoever they are, sends their ambassadors by sea. That implies the maritime province beyond Ethiopia. Okay, let's see what that might lead to. Uh, by the way, vessels and bulrushes, uh, the word bulrushes doesn't show up a lot in uh, the Gomek. It's, it, means, uh, it could mean a swallow, drink, absorbent, porous. It means a lot of different things. In what it, it's an ancient term and it doesn't show up much, so we're not sure what that really means. But anyway, it's in vessels upon the sea. Saying, go ye swift messengers to a nation, and the King James says scattered and peeled. It's a rather strange translation. The word scattered only occurs here in the entire Bible, in the Hebrew. It's mashak. It seems to mean draw, sow, sound, prolong, develop, tall, continue, defer, extend, or stretch out. It's a root that could mean any of those things. So let's, it's, it's, a, it's a nation that apparently is developed or stretched out, okay. And it is peeled. Again, it's a strange translation. Marout means obstinate, also means independent, not just peeled. So another, what may be a more comfortable translation is simply that it is a nation that is developed and independent. That would be a valid translation of that, those Hebrew words, whatever that means. To a people terrible from the beginning, in other words, people have never been defeated. To this time, a nation measured out and traversed, whose land the rivers have spoiled or traversed. Now, there are those that because of those phrases, and all those re phrases are going to be repeated in verse 7, sort of poetically. There are those that try to make chapter 18 refer to the United States, because it is a nation that is uh, shadowing with wings, you know, I don't know, aviation, whatever, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, it's uh, to the west of Ethiopia. It is not connected by land. Our ambassadors have to go by sea or by air, actually. It is a nation that is uh, stretched out and developed. It is a uh, nation that's never been defeated in battle, in a sense, at least. 
a nation that does measure. And one of the things, unless you've taken a, a, a course in geopolitics or military science, you probably would, or, or commercial courses uh, in geography, you might not be sensitive to the fact that the United States has got incredibly rare water system. Here in the West, we're not that conscious of it, but if you study the United States as an entity, you know that in the East and the Midwest, there's an incredible waterway system that is one of the major factors that caused uh, the United States to emerge so strong during the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution and the rest of it. So this is, fair, in fairness to some of the commentators, it is a provocative possibility. Normally, I jump on these things. I get a big kick out of them. However, this one, for some reason, while I want to share it with you in candor, it doesn't turn me on for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you grant the premise that this does refer to the United States, you haven't learned anything. We're going to discover that this land is going to be judged. That's no surprise. You know, Billy Graham summarized that so well. If God doesn't judge this country, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You look around this country and quickly get the impression that uh, if you know anything, any biblical perspective at all, you know that we're ripe for judgment. So uh, granting the premise, is, it's interesting, it's a possibility. Most of the more conservative scholars still view this as referring to, of course, you know, uh, Ethiopia or maybe some province that Israel had traffic with back in those old days. In any case, we're down to verse 3. All the inhabitants of the world and dwellers of the earth see when he lifted up an ensign upon the mountains, and we blow the trumpet here. For so the Lord hath uh, said unto me, I will take my rest, and I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Small point that you and I, not being agriculturally oriented, may catch here. Having dew in the spring is wonderful, and the harvest is bad. In other words, verse 4 is not good, okay? A cloud of dew and the heat of harvest ain't good. It may sound like it, but it's uh, agriculturally, you know, if you're a farmer, that would not be going on. And for before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening on the flower, he shall both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. They shall be left together unto the fowls of the mountains and to the beasts of the earth, and the fowls shall summer upon them, and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them. It's in very agricultural terms, but it's basically talking about judgment. It will not be a good harvest. It will be judged. It will be judged. And then verse 7 sort of wraps it up. In, the, in that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts by a people scattered and stripped from a people terrible from the beginning to this time, a nation measured out and trampled underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. So verse 7 is sort of a recap of the introductory phrases in verse 2. Between those you have a judgment. So a number of people publish books saying, aha, see this is the United States, and they go through all the bending of the text, and there's an old expression in the, the uh, data processing industry, if you torture the data enough, it'll eventually confess, you see. And so uh, some of these things are of that nature. Well, I've been sort of skipping along, as you can tell, because I was anxious to make sure we got to 19. And uh, since we are a little ahead of schedule, I apparently overdid it. There's probably a number of notes that I have failed to share with you. I know you feel very deprived about that, but uh, bear up, right? <laughs> now, uh, chapter 19 is on Egypt. And um, since we're a little ahead of schedule, we'll jump right in. Chapter 19, verse 1. The burden of Egypt, the Massa, the burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud, and shall come into Egypt, and the, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And I will set the Egyptians against Egyptians, and they shall fight every one against his brother, and every one against his neighbor, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, this obviously has had a historical fulfillment, but there are portions of it that sound very contemporary. If you have been following and do any reading of the background of some of the recent wars, between Israel and Egypt. Uh, this is rather graphic. Egypt will be mentioned seven times in the front end of this. Uh, let's go a little further. Verse 3, The spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst of it, and I will destroy the counsel of it, and they shall seek to the idols, to the charmers, and to the mediums, and to the, I should say, channelers, and uh, to the wizards. Then the Egyptians will I give over to the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Now, I should mention a little background here. Egypt at the time Isaiah was writing outwardly was in an alliance with Judah. The northern kingdom, 
Israel, the house of Israel was in alliance with Syria. Southern kingdom had a uh, loose outward alliance with uh, Egypt. The Isaiah told him not to rely on Egypt as an ally for a lot of reasons, and Egypt falls apart. A lot of internal strife. There's internal uh, uh, wars among the various elements. They fall apart. They become a series of independent states. But they are then reunited by a Semitikus, uh, a, uh, a very cruel lord who may be the fulfillment of verse 4, that brought them back together and re-welded it into a nation. Now, it's interesting that Egypt's original, way, way back, uh, religion apparently was monotheistic, but of course, in all of this, it becomes very polytheistic. And of course, the ten plagues in uh, the book of Exodus speak of the gods that uh, Egypt worshipped. The birds, the beasts, the, uh, the reptiles, the crocodiles, the asp, the insects, the scarab, and, and uh, the Beelzebub, in fact, means the flies. All of that, of course, is the background for the plagues, the ten plagues of Exodus. But they are, anyway, re regathered under the uh, rulership of a cruel lord. It's interesting, too, though, some scholars feel that verse 4 has also been fulfilled in its subsequent history. Because uh, Egypt, when it was taken over by the Arabs and then the, and then the Turks, the, Tur the Ottoman Empire was taxed into poverty that it is never recovered from. And the back of that country was broken through the taxation of those centuries of rule under the Ottoman Empire, and uh, it is uh, it has never rebounded from that. But now I'd like to jump in a little bit in verses 5 through 10. Let's back up a little bit before we do that. Let's recount some more familiar history. If you did any reading in ecology or, or, or uh, current events in the 60s, you may recall that the great project of the decade was the Aswan Dam. Egypt, throughout its history, has been uh, benefited by the Nile. The Nile is its major backbone. It goes through cycles of flooding that, on the one hand, are crucial to their agriculture, on the other hand, a nuisance. And the Aswan Dam was conceived and then executed to put the Nile under, quote, control, close quote. And it took 10 years to build it. And if you read in the 60s, there are frequent articles of all this, this incredible project called the Aswan Dam that the Soviet Union assisted Egypt with. And, of course, it was finished, uh, I think, essentially uh, the 70s. I forgot the exact dates. If you read the articles subsequent to 1970 of the results of the Aswan Dam, it's fascinating. And if you want to read one of those articles by going to the library and digging out a, you know, one of the magazines, you can do that. Or you can read Isaiah chapter 19, verses 5 through 11. The water shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up, and they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defense shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds of the flag shall wither. Paper reeds by the brooks, and by the mouth of the brooks, everything sown by the brooks shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast hook into the brooks shall lament, and they that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave cotton cloth shall be confounded, and they shall be broken in the purposes thereof all that make the sluices and ponds for fish. <laughs> it's interesting because since the Aswan Dam has been put in place, the water is no longer muddy, it's clear, it's wonderful, they got it all in control, except the problem is what the Nile always did is it brought nutrients downriver. Those nutrients provided an attraction for fish in the Mediterranean so that the fishing industry of Egypt was always rich and plentiful. It ain't anymore. They're all starving to death. You've got a 40 million people nation that's got a problem feeding itself. Furthermore, it turns out there are some snails that attack the flax, which makes the linen, and these reeds and the various things upon which Egypt has been dependent for millennia. These snails are always washed away by the flooding of the Nile. With the control of the Aswan Dam, the snails have multiplied and killed off all those crops that, upon which Egypt used to gain an enormous economic benefit. There have been articles printed that one of the best things they could do would be to blow the thing up. Okay. 
But um, the ecologists have had a field day because they're great at 2020 hindsight, and they, of course, point out that all the things they should have done or they should have known and so forth, that's great. In fairness to the experts, some of these interdependencies, these closed-loop systems, operate counterintuitively, as you may know. And uh, so these things are tragic and unfortunate. Yeah, but it's a mammoth, mammoth project that was not thought through and has, of course, tragically injured Egypt. And the criticism of it is laid out rather clearly right here. Verse 11. Surely the princes of Zon, and by the way, a little background, Zon is on the northeast border of Egypt. Another name for Zon is Tanis. And those of you that uh, may remember the movie the Raiders of the Lost Ark, of all the several different theories about the Ark of the Covenant, they picked up the one that it was hidden in Tanis to make the little tongue-in-cheek plot thing work. But you may recall Tanis there. That's just that's the it's in the northeast border of Egypt. Its biblical name is Zon. Surely the princes of Zon are fools. The council of the wise counselors of Pharaoh has become stupid. How say ye unto Pharaoh? I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings. Where are they? Where are the wise men? Let them tell thee now, and let them know what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zon are become fools. The princes of Memphis are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that are the stay of his tribes. It's been suggested that verses 11, 12, and 13 might be typed up and sent to the ministry in the Soviet Union that gave them the technical assistance to, to build that dam. The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst of it, and they have caused Egypt to err in every work of it, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. <laughs> Isaiah is not short of articulation. Really? As we go, you notice even in English, you notice how he shifts styles. I mean, he's a very rich writer. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have a stilted style at all. He, he really rises to the occasion. Verse 15, Neither shall there be any work it for Egypt, which the head or tail branch or bush may do. Tragic, tragic situation. The poverty, the unemployment, the uh, agriculture, tragic situation. You know, Anwar Sadat, when he did his peace treaty with Israel, was uh, uh, well advised. He, in effect, uh, alienated himself, sacrificed his life, frankly, for peace in the Middle East because he had 40 million people to feed and to deal with, and he didn't have time for all the other stuff. Verse 16, in that day shall Egypt be like women. I apologize, gals. Isaiah uses an idiom, a figure of speech here that uh, is, of course, quite old-fashioned and chauvinistic. I apologize for him on that. In that day shall Egypt be like women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Every one that maketh mention of it shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. Interesting. If you read any of the stories of the Yom Kippur War and all of this, it's interesting to uh, see the terror. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, you know, barracks humor that comes out of those wars. But clearly, though, the uh, light of Israel was a terror unto uh, Egypt. It's interesting that Eric Sharon and his tank corps... <laughs> you know, crossed over and um, circled the entire Egyptian Third Army. There's reason to believe that uh, Moscow and the United States knew what he had done before he did. Because the heat of battle, he may not have realized his full tactical advantage, but the Kremlin knew about it right away, and they were boarding troop ships to enter. And uh, Khrushchev called Nixon to, assuming nothing would happen, that he was going to go into the war. It was one of the things Nixon did right. He went right away and uh, put everything on alert and sent Kissinger in there and they de-escalated it down. But it was getting pretty exciting. Of course, Israel is pretty upset because by our interference, they, they, we disenfranchised them of the advantage. They had actually circled and cut off the entire Egyptian Third Army. It's one of those cases where the satellite reconnaissance was better than the tactical insights available. But uh, it causes Israel to make the quip, uh, the one, you know, after the Persian, you know, 100-hour Persian Gulf crisis, the quip that Israel says, the one thing that Israel exports to the United States is how not to finish a war. So, in any case, in that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. And you change one vowel, and that is the city of Heliopolis, the suburb of Cairo. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border of it to the Lord. Now that's kind of a weird phrase. In that day, 
there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Okay. And a pillar at the border of it to the Lord. The next verse says, and it shall be for a sign. Oh, wait a minute. That means that the pillar and which also could be monument, the monument and the altar are the same thing, right? Because it mentions it twice, but in typical Hebrew structure, they'll often say something two different ways. As you read the Proverbs, you'll notice the whole concept of Hebrew poetry is not meter and rhyme. It's rather, it's putting two ideas in juxtaposition. Sometimes they're contrast, sometimes they're comparisons, which are different. And uh, sometimes the same thing just said two ways, right? That's the typical Hebrew style. Here, though, it says, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border of it to the Lord. Well, you and I would think that something that's in the middle of the country and something that's in the border would be contradiction. Turns out, though, that when we sent an ambassador to check out the Suez Canal progress way back when, the cartographer, he happened to notice in, in studying Cairo and the rest, he noticed two things simultaneously. One is that Egypt traditionally has been the marriage of two countries, Upper and Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt being the southern part, that is upriver, Lower Egypt being in the Delta region. And the Pharaoh of Egypt always had a, a helmet or a, a crown that was two colors, red and white, for Upper and Lower Egypt. His title all through the many dynasties of Egypt, he was the Pharaoh of Upper and Lower Egypt. Where is the border between Upper and Lower Egypt? Right through a place called Giza, which in Arabic means border. It also happens that that place is a place that it, you, if you look at the northern part of Egypt, it is like a quadrant of a circle. In other words, one-fourth of a circle, because the Nile Delta is almost a perfect curve, uh, radius. And if you put a compass to draw that, the point of your compass sits at a place called Giza, which in Arabic means border. What is located at that point? The Great Pyramid. So many scholars feel that Isaiah chapter 19, verses 19 and 20, refer to the Great Pyramid. If that's true, it's kind of interesting. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border of it to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign, and a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Really? For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a Savior, a great one, and he shall deliver them. Whew! Kind of neat. Kind of interesting. I'll come back to this. Let's just finish the chapter, and then we'll come back to that whole issue. Verse 21. And you'll discover that this starts to become very millennial. What we're about to read is yet future. It's in the millennium, but it's very interesting. Verse 21, The Lord shall be known to Egypt. The Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Oh, really? Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. The Lord shall smite Egypt, and he shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated by them and shall heal them. In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian unto Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. I know it's hard to believe that any Arab group would communicate with each other and be cooperative, you know, but it's interesting. Verse 24, in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Fabulous. Peace at that time. But it's millennial. Don't look for it on the near horizon. But let's get back to verse 19 and 20. The more you study the great pyramid of Egypt, the more mysterious it becomes. The first thing you learn if you really dig into this is that it's not Egyptian. Uh, Manathos, which is one of the main priestly scribes of, who crept a chronicle upon which we build most of our understanding of the early dynasties and the ancient history of Egypt, records the building of the Great Pyramid as occurring by a group of people that came. He called them the Hyksos. He presumed they were from Arabia or somewhere. They came and took over the country without a battle. 
some scholars infer by some kind of mind control. When they came, they destroyed all the polytheistic temples and shrines. They built the Great Pyramid and then left. Strange stuff. Strange stuff. As we study the Great Pyramid, we're fascinated because, see, all the other pyramids of Egypt are set up for tombs. The tombs are underneath the pyramid. The pyramid itself is essentially solid. The tomb is underneath the pyramid. The Great Pyramid at Giza is very, very different. It is filled with angles and channels and passageways, and the next time we meet, we'll have a view graph, and I'll take you through this. Many people in history have presumed that the Pyramid at Giza was designed to be just a complicated labyrinth of tombs, except it's never been used that way. It turns out that the Great Pyramid, first of all, its physical structure is rather staggering. It covers 13 acres. It has uh, six and a half million tons of stones, some of which weigh 15 tons each. They are fitted together within a precision of the cracks are true to within one fiftieth of an inch. The uh, passageways are so precise, like within a fiftieth of an inch in a 150 foot span, you would have a tough time building it today with laser aligned drilling tools. It is level within one inch on 13 acres. If anybody's in surveying, think about that. The precision of the uh, fittings are more precise in relative to their linear lengths than the tiles on our space shuttle. But that's just the beginning. It's lined up exactly with the cardinal points, the, the meridians of the Earth, due north, south, and all that. The mathematics of the Great Pyramid include frequently 54 different ways it speaks of the number pi in mathematics, the ratio of the, which is something that the experts didn't think e Egyptians discovered for a thousand years later. The ratio of pi over e, if you're in calculus, is embodied in the structures. If you look at the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, you discover that it is a mathematical model of our solar system. The distance of the Earth to the Sun, the size of the Earth, and so forth. And the more you get into this, it's easy to get caught up in this thing and totally absorbed and become what some people call a pyramidiot, okay? <laughs> but what makes it such a provocative thing is there are those that believe that the internal passageways of the Great Pyramid lay out the gospel, that the passageways, the angles, speak of the uh, exodus of Egypt, the birth of Christ, the time of his baptism, and I'll, hope, I'll take you through it easier with a diagram, why people have embraced that idea. Part of the search of the Great Pyramid has to do with determining its basic unit of measure, called a pyramid inch. It turns out that the pyramid is 5,449 pyramid inches high. If you take the Hebrew text, Isaiah chapter 19, verse 19 and 20 in Hebrew, and take the numerical values of the letters, what do you think it adds up to? 5,449, the height of the pyramid and pyramid inches. So on it goes, and I'll, sh I'll share with you some of the things that they've discovered or feel they've discovered about the Great Pyramid, which makes it appear that it fits this very thing that God talks about in Isaiah 19, right? Okay, that's just for starters, friends. In the Salisbury Plain in England, there is a monument called Stonehenge. And I had occasion for a number of reasons many years ago to study it intensely for a lot of reasons. And of course, Gerald Hawkins is famous for his discovery that that ancient monument built uh, 3,500 years ago or more is in fact an astronomical computer. It predicts eclipses, among other things. And it's hard to talk about Stonehenge without having diagrams, so we'll talk about Stonehenge too. But its architecture is built around four key stones that make an approximate rectangle. There's only one latitude in the Northern Hemisphere where a rectangle would have the predictive properties that it has, and Stonehenge is less than a mile from that latitude. And the rectangle is just a hair off, has the exact adjustment you need to make up for that mile so that it will predict certain things. The two diagonal stones of that, of that rectangle, point in azimuth to 118 degrees from north, which lines it up directly with the Great Pyramid of Egypt. People who have studied Stonehenge believe 
that the same architect had to build both of them, that the Great Pyramid in Egypt and the monument at Stonehenge were masterminded by the same architect. The speculations are all over the map, and we'll go over those next time, but they include the idea that both monuments were built by Shem, the son of Noah. And I'll show you why they believe that next time. See, the other thing that people have discovered is that the ancient Egyptian culture is known among scholars as having a strange paradox in that it starts at a high level. There isn't a buildup. The earliest records of Egypt have central government, mathematics, astronomy, all kinds of skills, and it puzzles them because it isn't as if it, there's sort of a buildup, like a, a growth, a learning period, but it's there. The same thing's true in Mesopotamia, the Sumerian culture. They have language. Now they're beginning to discover there's some links between them. Now, that causes scholars to be puzzled. Science has a gigantic dilemma because anyone that is informed today cannot buy evolution. It's an old idea that we were all brought up on, but it's nonsense. Current discoveries in most fields of science have totally debunked the idea that biogenesis occurred by itself. That's preposterous. Uh, the cosmologist now and the current insights to the so-called Big Bang models clearly demonstrate that the universe is finite and had a beginning that not only matter and energy, but time and space started. You could argue about exactly when, but it had a beginning. That's embarrassing, because it had a beginning, somebody had to start it. Secondly, since 1957 and the discovery of the DNA molecule and the discovery that the DNA code is a digital code, error-correcting digital code, is mind-blowing. It totally destroys the idea that we're here in the absence of design. So science has got a problem. How are they going to begin to re-rationalize our whole tradition? So we'll explore that next time, the signs in the heavens, the Great Pyramid, the Stonehenge, and all of that. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And bring your friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be wild stuff next time. You don't come to Chuck Mr. Bible Study without getting something really off the wall. Well, we're, we'll make up for some lost time next time.